Hey, so I'm Adam. Uh, for those who don't know me, I have been an engineer for about two decades. Um, maybe about half of that time has been uh, in Ruby. And I am currently at uh, Air Clinics, a company I think you can hear a lot more about. Um, Air Clinics is a next generation clinical platform built by the healthcare community uh, to run tomorrow's home visit telehealth and clinic health uh, services. But I actually genuinely believe in the company vision. And so I say, watch this space. I've actually never been more proud to be a Ruby developer. Uh, thanks to amazing contributions from organizations like GitHub, Shopify, uh, Stripe, both Ruby and Rails have a really compelling story to tell in the enterprise space. Whether it's uh, parallelism uh, and concurrency via fibers and reactors, uh, the type signatures and static analysis that's provided by IBS and RBI files and tools like Steep and Sorbet, or active record support for like more complex database configurations and strict loading uh, protection with uh, from against n plus one queries. Uh, Ruby and the community is showing that you can have developer happiness and developer tooling. Oh, sorry, <laughs> enterprise tooling. Um, and seven point one Rails seven point one is looking like it could be the uh, the biggest minor release in Ruby on Rails history. These though, they're obviously not the kind of features that um, people normally like to nerd out about. Although I did recently get a little bit too excited speaking about um, uh, common table expressions in active record with an SQL developer. Uh, but it's these kind of boring features that allow us to focus on providing value, which is really all that matters. Back in 2015, Matt set a goal for Ruby 3. He wanted Ruby 3 to be three times faster than Ruby 2. This was an ambitious goal and it required uh, considering performance from many different angles. One of those angles was to implement a just-in-time compiler or JIT. Now, the reason why this is a lightning talk is I figured that while a couple of you will probably be interested in how a JIT increases performance, most of you would probably be hating life. And so given this, I'm just gonna oversimplify. Um, while we write Ruby in English, English is not the language that your computer understands. And so your code needs to be translated, what we call compiling. And the first step in the compilation process is called uh, lexical analysis. This is where the code is broken down into its individual parts. So we're talking the keywords, identifiers, operators, literals. Then a syntax analysis or parsing analyzes the structure of the code to ensure that it conforms to the rules of the Ruby language. Next, an abstract syntax tree is constructed. The AST is a hierarchical representation of the code that can be easily traversed and manipulated by a machine. The semantic analysis stage then checks the code for semantic errors and uh, to ensure that um, it uses the proper language constructs. But it's at this point that it's finally possible to compile the AST into bytecode. And that's run by Yav the Ruby's um, virtual machine. Bytecode, it's quite efficient, um, but it's still a platform independent, high level representation. When your code is run, Yav converts the bytecode into machine code, which is the binary representation 
that is specifically designed to work on the platform it's being run on. In other words, it's the difference between generic instructions that can work on any platform and the specific instructions that say my Mac can follow. The JIT adds an additional asynchronous step to this process. It monitors which code is being run, looking for methods that are called frequently, and it pre-compiles and stores the, code, the, the machine code into memory. So it's just in time in the sense that it's happening while your code is being executed, but it isn't really just in time in the sense that it has to warm up. It's gonna go, it's gonna take some metrics and then based on those metrics, it's gonna decide what areas of the application it believes it can provide value. Now, if you wanna get into the fine details of how your code is run, I would highly recommend uh, Ruby under a microscope. Um, it's been around a long time, so it doesn't get into JITs and some of the, de the fine details have changed but it's actually still a really fantastic reference. Now, there have been a few JITs uh, for Ruby, but the most exciting one so far has been YJIT. Created by Shopify, YJIT was added to Ruby as an experimental option in 3.1, but now under 3.2, it's stable. It was originally written in C, but that had some serious drawbacks. And so it was ported to Rust and actually became the first Rust code that was added to Ruby core. And this was discussed in some detail recently in uh, Remote Ruby. Um, so I would highly recommend checking out that, uh, that episode. But one implication of the transition to Rust is that you need to have the Rust compiler installed before you compile Ruby. If you don't have the Rust um, compiler, Ruby will still build, but YJIT won't be installed. But it's pretty easy to install. On Unix-like systems like Mac, Linux, there's just a single command on the, on the Rust Lang website, uh, and that's, that's all you need. I recently deployed to an Ubuntu server and I was able to um, add the, the compiler to my Altitude install. Really only took like a minute. So if you wanna check if YJIT is available, you can pass Ruby the enable YJIT flag. In this example, um, Rust was not installed before Ruby. And so you see nowhere in that string does it reference YG. Whereas in this case, because the Rust compiler was installed, you'll see that uh, YG shows up in there. Now, I was just blown away when I, um, when I enabled YG. Um, and I saw a one third decrease in server response time. This is just extraordinary improvement for something as simple as just passing a flag. Unfortunately though, you can't assume that you will get the same result. And you absolutely should lean on your application performance monitoring. Because I know you're electively using your APMs, right? <laughs> uh, if you're not already on Ruby 3.2, make sure you perform that upgrade first. 3.2 had some lovely performance improvements and you wanna be able to measure the JIT in isolation. But for most of us, that's it. Like you just sit back and just let the magic happen. For organizations with code that runs at large scale, however, there could be value in optimizing some methods. It's generally a bad idea to adapt your code to the JIT, particularly one that's so new and likely to change. Uh, but the YJIT documentation does offer some guidelines. For example, um, variables that change type 
can make life difficult for jets. So you might avoid, for example, um, setting a, a variable, sorry, with a value of say nil, and then later assigning a string to that same variable. Um, V8, the Google JavaScript engine, uses a JIT to speed up JavaScript execution. And the V8 team have a fantastic blog. And I really enjoyed this article. Um, it got into the details of an issue in V8 that was uncovered by the React team. In order to explain the problem, they needed to get into some of the fine details about how V8 and just JITs in general, uh, how they work and the complexity in optimizing a dynamic language. So if you're interested in understanding how to write code that's optimized for JITs, it's actually a really great place to start. You shouldn't, however, optimize for any specific JIT, but if you have the scale to justify it, there, um, there's some standard conventions that you can follow. Uh, I'm not working at that scale, so I'm just taking the easy win. And these are the references I have mentioned, and I am open to questions. Well, we're done.